Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for all of your gifts. This Easter season, we're especially thankful for the gift of your son, Jesus, our good shepherd, who selflessly places his body in between us and those who wish to harm us, um, and that he is victorious over them. We also give you thanks for the blessing of mothers on this Mother's Day. We're so thankful that you have placed mothers into our lives um, and set up the family the way you have so that they can be a perfect example of the love that you have for us, the, the love that sacrifices and serves for those who, who need them. Um, and we ask that you bless our Bible study and our discussion as we uh, continue to learn more and, and dig into your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, if you have the one from last time, great. If not, that's okay. At the very back side of that, we're going to finish up the section on confession. Uh, but the, the handout up here is a new one because we're going to get to our discussion of the Lord's Supper. I want to get into that pretty quick um, for the, uh, since we only have two classes left. Okay. So, confession. What is confession? Start with the basic question. Don't everybody jump up and run. <laughs> Not a trick question, I promise. Admitting that you did something wrong. Admitting that you did something wrong. Very good, right? So when you confess, you confess to doing the thing that somebody has asked you about. Did you do this? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Right? That. Yeah, I did. That's your confession, right? When do we do our confession to the church? Huh? Communion? Um, before communion. Before communion, yeah. We do it at the beginning of the service, right? So imagine that you did something wrong as a kid. Maybe you're breaking curfew, and you know you're not going to get back in time, right? You know, your parents know that you did something you weren't supposed to, right? Um, usually then, if you come home, what's the first thing that's addressed? You are late, right? You're in trouble, right? We don't, we don't go and have dinner and do a bunch of other stuff and then talk about that later, right? Because it's the elephant in the room. Because the whole time you've been doing all that other stuff, what's your thought going to be? You're going to be like, oh, man, when's it coming? When is it coming? I know I'm in trouble. Well, when is it going to come down, right? Uh, and for the parent, maybe you're you know, trying to do other things, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, what am I going to be doing here with this? They're going to get punished. What's the punishment? How are we going to have a conversation about this, right? And so... Why do you think we do that at the beginning of the service? To prepare ourselves. To prepare communion. ourselves? Yeah. What did you say, Tim? For communion. For communion especially. But it's the elephant in the room, right? We're coming into the throne room of the king of the universe, God of grace. And we know that he knows that we didn't do the things we were supposed to do. Or we did some things we weren't supposed to do, right? And so in a way, I like it at the front of the service because it's an admonition of like, we got to deal with the elephant in the room. Right? Despite all that God has done for me, I still didn't do what I was supposed to do. Right? And until that, that burden is relieved, it's much more difficult to believe in the gospel promises you're going to hear in the service. Because you're going to be so focused on beating yourself up for all the things that you didn't do, right? So confession has two parts. So we talked about one. That is, as Kurt said, what? Admitting you did something wrong. Admitting you did something wrong. That's part one. What's part two? Asking for, Asking for forgiveness. All right. That's part of the confession of sins. What the second part is? Turning. Turning away from the How do you turn away from it? What has to happen? Repent. Huh? Repent. How do you repent? What has to happen? Sure. Yeah, you get forgiveness, right? So the second part of confession is called absolution. Right? So first you confess, you admit your sins, and you appeal to the mercy of God, right? So going back to our example with the parents, you know that they know, so there's no lie you can tell. Right? What's the only recourse you have? Asking for mercy, right? 
that's all we've got with God. We can't, we can't, you know, bandy words with him. We can't make fancy negotiations because we know that he knows all the way down what we really are, who we really are, what we've done, what we have, right? And so we appeal to his mercy, right? And that's an important distinction. It's extremely important that in our confession, we're not sort of justifying ourselves before God. We're recognizing that that is a futile exercise. We got nothing to stand on, right? What's the only thing we have to stand on? Jesus. And that's what we say, right? We say, because of what Jesus has done, have mercy on us. Because of his innocent suffering and death, have mercy on us. Right? And then the absolution says to you what? Almighty God has given his son to die for you and for his sake. He forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are proclaimed, it's pronounced, your forgiveness is pronounced upon you. Okay? And who is doing the forgiving? God is doing it. Through the pastor, through the office of the pastor. That's why we're very careful to say, in the stead and by the command of, or by the authority of Jesus. Right? And we talked about that a little bit a couple weeks ago at the office of the keys, right? That he, that's where he gave that, that ability to the church to be exercised through the office of the called pastor. Right? And that's what the congregation agreed to when they called the particular pastor who's serving them. They called him to do exactly that in recognition of the calling from God, right? <clears throat> okay, now, a couple of you mentioned the Lord's Supper in, in, in tandem with that. Why are those two linked? Because we don't want to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Yeah. Right, and so one of the things that Paul says is that we ought to examine ourselves. And what do we find when we examine ourselves? Sin. Sin, right? And who is the Lord's Supper for? Just you? Just us here? It's for repentant sinners. Right? So the office of the keys is based on, we talked about that, it's based on the state of repentance or unrepentance. If somebody is unrepentant, then my job is actually to lovingly rebuke them and say, until you repent of this open and public sin, I cannot, I cannot give you the Lord's Supper. As soon as they repent, there's great rejoicing and they are welcomed to the table. Um, so, yeah. Because the the meal is being offered to those who believe in the promises of the gospel, right? And for somebody who's unrepentant, what they're actively doing is not believing in the promises of the gospel. So they're, they're rejecting. So it's not that God isn't offering them forgiveness, both by his word and through the sacraments, but that they are they are rejecting that. They feel no need for it on whatever the particular issue is. So if the church has said, the Bible says this, and this is a sin, and they're like, that's not a sin. I don't need to repent of that. Then they're, they're rejecting that, right? And so if they're in that state of mind, the scriptures tell us, and we're going to read 1 Corinthians 11 here today, in 1 Corinthians 11, it tells us that then we would be actually keeping spiritual trouble upon spiritual trouble because they would be guilty concerning the body and blood of Jesus. And we'll, we'll get into some of the details of that. Um, so we have, uh, if you want a good story on confession and absolution, read 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And that's a story, familiar story, David and Bathsheba. And just to do a little summary of that, and then we'll move on to the communion part. Uh, what was David's sin in that story, for those who can recall some of the details? Huh? Adultery? Murder? Adultery? Murder. 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 Pride. 
pride, right? What's the one that ties all that together in the story? What does he do once all those things have happened? He covers them up, right? He's unrepentant of them, right? And so that unrepentance leads to the further sins you listed. So first it's adultery and lust, right? He sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof and, and decides that he wants her, and so he takes her, even though she's married, right? Knowing what he's done is wrong, but he won't admit it, he then tries to pass it off like Uriah came home. But this you can almost sketch this as uh, do this as like a a sketch, like a satire sketch, because Uriah comes home at the behest of the king, and the king says, you know, why don't you go home, old man, you know, spend some time with your wife, you know? And Uriah's like, I can't do that. Why, why would I do that when the men that I'm fighting with can't come home and do that? That would be dishonorable. And so he, his honor repeatedly, repeatedly rebuffs David's attempts to cover up his own sin. Well, when that doesn't work, David has him killed. Right, so you see how all of these, these sins down the line were all about David covering up the original thing that he did because he wasn't repentant of it. Right, his, his whole life became all about how I can make sure nobody else finds out this one thing that I did. Right? And so what does God do? Remember? Yeah, he sends Nathan. And what, is, what does he tell Nathan to say? You're the man. Yeah, right? <laughs> And, and he says that by telling a story, right? And what was David's reaction to the story? The story is the rich man who has all these sheep, has some friends over, and instead of killing one of his own sheep, he takes the one sheep from the man, the poor man who only has one, and kills it for his feast. And what is David's reaction to that story? Yeah, where is that dude at? He deserves to die. And then Nathan says, you're the man, right? Match that term, right? And then what happens? What does David do? He repents, right? He repents, and it's only until uh, up until then, nothing goes well because everything then becomes about the covering of the sin, the self justification of David's actions, not only to himself but to everyone else. So communion's out of the question. Right? Worshiping God is out of the question because he doesn't have any time for that. He's got to make sure nobody finds out. He's got to make sure that people still think he's this good king despite all this stuff, right? So that's the power of the confession and the absolution. Right? And so, like, when I have, uh, at my previous call, when I had high school students going off to college, that was one of the things that I told them is that, you know, I really hope you go to an LCMS church. And this is one of the reasons that I do, but maybe you don't have that option where you're going to school. Maybe there's one nearby and you don't have a car, maybe you can't drive an hour to get there. If you don't, find a church that pronounces the forgiveness of your sins. Because a lot of churches, all they do is explain what it is. They tell you about it, but it's never pronounced upon you. And that's a crucial difference, because if it's just told about you, it's never applied to them specifically, and therefore it never relieves the burden of the guilt. It just piles up over, over time. Right? So that's why we do that here. Right? That's, that's why that's a big part of the theology of worship in our church, is that that's one of the gifts that God has given. All right, any questions about that? Okay. Now turn to your new, out, your new uh, handout here. We're going to get into some communion stuff okay so the first box there we're going to read what is the sacrament of the altar together it is the true body and blood of our lord jesus christ under the bread and wine instituted by christ himself for us christians to eat and to drink all right so what are some key words there true all right what do we mean by true why would why would Luther bother to write true? Only authentic, genuine, literal. Yeah. Literal, right? Yeah, because he's addressing there are people that, that believe that it's not correct. They believe that it's symbolic. So he's addressing that as a heretical teaching of the Christian church. 
saying that this is the true body and blood. Okay, what's another word? Instituted, or I thought we said instituted, right? Who instituted it? Christ, right? So that's a key thing of the sacraments. It has to be instituted by Christ himself. He's the one that gave the command to do it. Which is why we have less sacraments than the Catholic Church, for example. Right? So the Catholic Church says confirmation and marriage are sacraments. And we say, no, they're not. Now, do we say that because we don't think they're good things? No, we say that because we don't think there are things that are instituted by Christ for the purpose of salvation, for the purpose of forgiveness of sins and salvation. Right, so that's why we have two baptism and works. So if you don't get married your entire life, can you still be saved? Yes. If you don't have a formal rite of confirmation in a church, can you still be saved? Yes. Is the full reason it has to be instituted by Christ and contained in earthly substance? That's a, that's another qualification here, but we we have a more specific definition of sacrament. But at the root of it is that it's instituted by Christ for the purpose, like it's necessary to salvation. Right? It's commanded as a necessity that everyone should do, and a lot of the the sacraments of the Catholic Church don't fit that. So, because uh, if we just went by the substance, right, you could say that the anointing of the sick, which is one of their sacraments, would would qualify as a sacrament because it has the oil, right? but that's not something that we're commanded to do by Jesus. <clears throat> okay, uh, somebody want to look up Matthew chapter 26, 26 to 29, and then Mark 14, 22 to 25. And then Luke 22, 19 to 24. And if you've got your catechisms with you today, the part where I is on page 322. Of All right, somebody got the Matthew 26 one? While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood in the covenant, which was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I do not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that I will drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. All right, thank you. And then so we have the Mark 14 one. <coughs> Cooper. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for men. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. All right, and then Luke 22. Yeah. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Behold the hand of him. Six twenty one pastor. So three twenty four. Okay. But behold the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it can be who is going to do this. The dispute arose. As to which of them is regarded as the greatest. Okay. So we call those all what? The words of institution. Right? So this is where we call them that because this is where Christ instituted the Lord's Supper. Um, and so, and what what uh, Old Testament holiday is this done on? Passover, right? What was Passover? 
Is the anniversary or remembrance of the uh, life beneath, or the passing over of the angel of death? Very good. Yeah. So the, for the passing, of, remembrance of the passing over the angel of death. Um, and how did they remember that? Sacrificing a lamb and spreading blood on the lintel. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, they, they would sacrifice the lamb, uh, and this was a, a male lamb, a year old, unblemished, right? Um, foreshadowing again the lamb of God, right? Um, they make specific mention in the account of the crucifixion that they don't break Jesus' mm -hmm. legs, right? Um, because he's meant to be the unblemished lamb of God. Um, then they put the blood that pays the death price over the over the door, and that was the that was what told the angel of death to pass over the house, which is where the term comes from. Right? Now, when they celebrated it in years years after the actual event, did they still kill and eat the lamb? Yes, they did. No, they didn't. They still eat. Well, Jesus isn't in the picture yet. This is after the Passover. After the Passover, when they're when they're doing this in remembrance of the Passover, do they still kill a lamb and eat it? Yeah. Yeah. And so there, a, a part of the remembrance of Passover isn't the remembrance of the killing of the lamb and the smearing of blood. It's it's the actual sacrifice of the lamb, right? Which is why we continue to be talking in language of the participation in the sacrifice of Christ even today. Right? Because when he says, do this in remembrance of me, he's not saying, do the, like, just have like a remembrance of the all these events of the breaking of the bread with my disciple. He's saying, do this in remembrance of my sacrifice. And the way you remember my sacrifice is the consumption of the thing that was offered in your place. Because otherwise, you're not actually tied to the sacrifice. Does that make sense? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So that's why that. So if if Christ hadn't done what he had done, my job would be very different. I would usually have some confirmation. Well, I'd be up there with a knife and <laughs> right? because I'd be killing animals. Right? That's a very different gift. <laughs> Um, and the reason that I don't do that anymore, the reason that that's not necessary anymore is because Christ was the sacrifice once for all. Now, there's still a sacrifice that's made when we gather in worship. It's the same sacrifice that was made on the cross, right? It's, it's a continuing sacrifice. It's not something that just happened a long time ago. It's continuing to be offered to you. The fruits of that sacrifice are continually offered to you until Christ returns. That's why there's some settings of our worship service where after uh, we say the words of institution, we say that whoever eats of this uh, this bread and drinks of this cup proclaims the Lord's death until he comes. And then uh, Paul says, is this not a participation in the sacrifice of Christ? Um, I think sometimes because we no longer have the temple sacrifice, the priest isn't up there killing, you know, 10 bulls to account for the sins of the people. We think that we've kind of left the visceral nature of, of justice in the eyes of God behind. We have not. There's still blood needed to be marking us so that the angel of death passes over. There's still a real sacrifice that, that is made and that we are participants in. And so that's part of the reason that we believe that it's really there because it was a real sacrifice and we're not saved by just recalling it. We're saved by it applying to us through the consumption of the sacrifice. And that was something that was in the temple as well, right? There was always a priestly uh, segment of the food. And the priest, because they weren't making sacrifices themselves, they had to participate somehow in the sacrifices. And so there was an element of the sacrifices that others make that the priests were required to eat. Yeah. Uh, in the first Passover, wasn't the blood mark made in a cross? Um, no, the blood was put on the lintels and the doorposts. Okay. So it was it was marking the entrance to the home. It was like a pie. <clears throat> so across. Yeah. 
And, and at that point, the cross really wouldn't have meant anything. Um, they may not have really done a crucifixion at that point. Right, right. Um, so it's important, to, it's important to keep that connection because I think when we lose the connection to Passover and what, what Christ is doing, this is why he's saying this cup is a new testament, new covenant in my blood. Right? In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the word for a covenant was the verb kafav, which meant to cut or etch. And that's why when you see a lot of covenants made in the Old Testament, there's always a sacrifice involved. And it also denotes that this covenant is not some something you can just erase or disappear. It's etched. It's cut into. It's a permanent thing, right? And so when Christ says this cup is the new covenant in my blood, he's taking the blood of Passover and now applying it to himself. And it's no longer the temporary passing over the angel of death. It is the once and for all blood paid price for the the forgiveness of sins for the whole world. When you take that blood and body into your own body, you become a participant, a beneficiary of the sacrifice of Christ. Pardon me. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing, I guess what you're saying is kind of like, uh, maybe not right, but you know what the term would be? It's contemporaneous. It says, like, it, when we go to the altar, it's the same as when it's the first. Yes. Uh, it's not. It's not a reenactment or anniversary. It is actually doing it again. Right. Yeah. Well, and I wouldn't say again. It is a like. Still. It is a yeah. Still is probably the better way to say. It. So the the what communion does is it lets us know that the sacrifice of Christ was not nearly the event on the cross 2,000 years ago, but it's a continual offering of the Lamb of God throughout time until he comes again. Right? Um, you can get into some interesting rationalizations of how that works if you think about like God being a being out of time um, and, and all of that kind of stuff, but really what's going on there is that when Christ died on the cross, that's a continual sacrifice that he's making an offering of himself, right? Because how can he be a sacrifice once and for all? What's the difference between his flesh and the flesh of the, the, the cows and the goats and the lambs of the Old Testament? <coughs> but what's the difference between his flesh? And what? Eternal, right? Through the resurrection, the flesh, the creation, has been restored to its original purpose of immortality. You were created to be a moral thing. Um, and so when Christ dies and rises, the reason that he's the sacrifice once and for all is because of his innocence and his eternity makes him the one price that could be paid that covers all the sins of creation. Right? And so it's, it's a continually offered thing. Right? Um, until, of course, he comes back and all of creation and the, the, the story of redemption and justice is, is, is close. Yeah. It's worth pointing out that the church I go to on Saturday nights, they did the, uh, the bread and wine represent uh, the body and blood of Christ. Right. The last night when there was communion, I did not take the communion. I just paid. Right, right. Because they're not offering you the same thing. Right. Uh, a lot of times we think, well, I know what it is, so it doesn't matter. Right. Um, and that's not true. And so it's actually a nice segue to 1 Corinthians 11. So everybody open up your Bible to 1 Corinthians 11. And before we begin our discussion on this, just to have a, a bit of sort of historical context here, there really was zero expectation of a non-believer and or someone who did not share your confession among believers to participate in communion together for the overwhelming majority of Christian, the history of the Christian church. But the idea that that is something that, that a church owes you as long as you believe in Jesus is a new thing and, and pretty American. Right? Um, so just as a context there, what we're going to be talking about 
is a much deeper root than, than that tradition. Right. Um, and I've, I've read some interesting articles recently. Somebody was talking about it, something and prompted me to read some articles. Um, similar to like the individual cups in communion. Um, for the first 1,930 years of the church, those weren't even an option available. Right. Um, because of the image of the one cup. Right? And there are still places in the world where the pastor consumes the elements after communion is done. And he does that in those places, even knowing that people in the congregation have diseases that he can get because of that. And because there's this element of the unity um, of the cup and the idea that like what Christ is doing in communion is not to bring disease and death. There's never been, there's never actually been any accounting for an outbreak of any sort of illness that is coming from the cup. Yeah. Um, that's not yeah. Yeah. And there are some Lutheran churches that that are are trying to go back to that. I know a couple of them that they used COVID as a springboard to get the individual cups removed. Um, I can remember um, a past church at the Hunter Guild, and um, so I was raised in Catholic, and I can remember accidentally dropping the wafers like on the floor when I was like setting up for the altar and. Um, that moment, I didn't know what to do because I was taught that you know all of that had to be removed. So that's literally what I did. I picked up off the floor, ate all of the papers, and I dropped them. And then afterwards, I checked with the pastor, and I believe that that is not the like the rule. Yeah. But yeah, so, it, was, it was like a funny, funny situation. Like, all right, God. Well, there's actually, well, now there's like, there's some really, you can find some funny, you can find some funny communion videos of Catholic churches in situations like that where, where a pastor is handing the wafer off to somebody and they drop it and it goes, you know, different places and somebody's cleavage or, or down their shirt or all these different things. And they're, they're funny because they're at a loss of real. You can't just like ignore that, right? But it's um, logical, though. What do you mean? It's logical. If your belief is this is body yes. of Christ. You don't throw yes. the body yeah, of Christ. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes, it makes total sense. You don't talk to the Yeah, yeah right. that's true. I don't yeah. I think we do that too. I don't know, where we don't, um, you're supposed to dump the, the wine on the ground instead of down the sink. Yes, so there's there's a couple of different ways that, that we, do, we can do that. Um, we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a second. We'll, so we'll talk about that. Um, but, but it, you're right, it is, it is not a super obscure thing. You may have also gone to a church where they have an extra pitcher up there of water and the, they pour the water in the common cup after communion so that they can swish it around to get all the wine out when they drink the water. Right. Um, so we, we're not, like, that's a totally fine practice to do if you would like to. And, and a lot, in a lot of places, it's really a conscience issue for the particular pastor. Because they're the one that's being held account for the, the distribution of the gifts. And so if it's a really big issue of conscience for them, um, typically it doesn't really affect that too much. Um, and so there are different ways it can be done. Um, so you may have seen that uh, in some places. Um, even in our own church, there are churches that do that. That's, I think, the practice now at Trinity um, in Pittsburgh in the city, is they'll do that after communion as well. Um, so there's different ways to do it, but we'll talk about kind of the principles that we follow there when it comes to the scriptures. Okay. Yet the wine used to be consumed there. It will be again. Um, <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so we're 1 Corinthians 11. We're starting at verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Okay, so first takeaway here is that just by gathering together, it's not automatically good. Okay. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. All right, so what point is Paul making here? Yeah, yeah, this isn't this isn't your dinner, right? You have houses, you can eat your dinner, and there's different purpose for this, right? So what are the reasons that you eat dinner at your house? Are you hungry? Fellowship, okay. Sustenance, right? You need it. What else? You make things that taste bad or good? Good, right? You want something to taste good, right? Yeah. Well, theoretically, right? <laughs> no. um, those things really have nothing to do with the Supper. So, like, one thing that really uh, bugs me is when I hear somebody complain about the taste of something when it comes to feeding us. Because that like what you're doing is you're receiving the body and blood of the Son of God, given freely out of love and death for you, and you're complaining about the taste. Right? And the only way that you're, and kids do that, understandably so, because they don't understand the distinction between eating this and eating that. But that's part of what we teach them, right? Is that the purpose of this gathering is not for you to get a wine that you really like the taste of, and for somebody to bake you a delicious loaf of bread. Right? You're receiving these things. For another purpose and so paul is kind of cutting through all of those distinctions as as unhelpful and not good right another example that i'll give in confirmation because usually the kids find it funny imagine that you're going to communion for the first time with your parents and your dad just drains the whole common cup in line right before you would that be appropriate maybe you just really needed some extra blood of jesus that week <laughs> Right? Where we don't think about that, right? Um, and so that's what, but he's saying that's what was going on here. Is there are people that were that were over consuming things and not leaving some for others. Right? So that's the wrong orientation about the Lord's Supper. We don't think of it in terms of, oh, today, this was a rough week, Pastor. I'm going to take three cups instead of one. Right? That's, so the quantity thing is not important. Right? The taste the sustenance you're gaining from it, that's not the purpose of these, this meal. Right? Yeah, Ron. I've had communion at times where I was the last one to see all this to the cup. So the pastor came to me and he would say, just finish this one. So we really was there, I just finished it now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because what he's talking about isn't isn't a right or wrong about the number, like the amount you consume. He's not saying you're only supposed to have one and a half ounces of wine, and if you go over that, it's bad. It's the, the spirit of your gathering, right? We're not gathering to consume these elements, the body and blood of Jesus, for the purpose of earthly sustenance or taste um, or any of those things. And so if you did that when there were more people behind you, it would be wrong because you are taking from them, right? But as if it's the same as a Catholic priest or a Lutheran pastor and elders consuming the remaining wine, uh, is because you're that's what it was set aside for. Like I said, we'll get into how it works. Okay, so that's that's where we're at on verse uh, verse 23. And then he goes on, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, that's not good. So, what does Paul do here? He's making sure they know this isn't something he made up. Right? Where is he saying it came from? It came from Jesus himself. Right? He's saying, I only gave to you what I have first received from Christ. And this is what I received. And he repeats the words of institution. Right? As a reminder, all of those other things that were going on, they're not the reason that this meal is being given to you. Okay? And then he says something interesting at the very end of here, verse 26. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right? And what I want to highlight here is that there are two aspects of communion. There's a private aspect, and that private aspect is that the words for you mean you. Right? This is my body given for you. Right? That's you specifically. This is my blood given for you. That's you specifically. That's extremely important. Right? I think a couple weeks ago we talked about that. Right? It takes the big, great work of God and make sure that you know that was done specifically for you. And that's an important thing, right? It's good. That is a moving and powerful experience for many people. It should be, right? It's the God of the universe taking his great work of salvation and giving it to you. It's an amazing thing. But what Paul's telling us here is that not the only thing that's happening. There's a public aspect to receiving communion as well. And the way that I talk about this with my confirmands is I'll say, um, is the Lord is going up to take the Lord's Supper a private or public act? Yes. Yes, right? Because do people see you go up and take it? They do, right? And those people aren't privy to whatever you're thinking in your head when you're taking it. Right? All they see is you going and getting it, right? Now, is that an act that has meaning or is it a meaningless act? Going up and getting communion. It's meaningful, right? So if it's public and it's meaningful, it automatically communicates something by definition. Right? And that's what Paul is talking about here, that by participating in this, you are proclaiming something. Right? Now, if all I have to go on is I see Kurt, and he goes to this church, and I'm visiting, and Kurt goes up and takes communion, after I've been told what this church believes about communion, what am I going to assume about Kurt? What is his action communicating to you? He believes the same thing, right? Now, let's say that in Kurt's head, he believes something else. Does that change what I perceive as someone who witnesses him take communion? It doesn't. I have no idea what's going on in Kurt's mind, right? And this is an argument that people will make. Well, it doesn't really matter where I take communion because I know what it is. And what Paul is saying is that doesn't fly because when you go up to communion, you're proclaiming something about Jesus. Right? So imagine in another context doing the same thing. And you're going to proclaim something about Jesus. And you say, Jesus was perfect. And then you turn around to somebody else and say, Jesus was mostly perfect. What is that going to do? It's going to confuse people. Like, wait a minute, you, you said this over here, and now you're saying this over here. Right? So the reason that in the Lutheran church, we practice closed communion, which means that, that we don't just give communion to everybody, we only give communion to people who share our public confession of faith, is for that reason, because it actually harms the witness of Jesus. It causes confusion. Right? And you can say all you want to yourself, well, in my own mind, I know what it is, but, but it's, a, it's a private and public act. As Paul's highlighting here, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. You're, you're in a situation yeah. where you're on the option of private people, and you have Presbyterian. I huh? know what it means to you, even though you may have So we would say on the public side of things, he's not he's not offering you what you're looking for. I know, but I'm desperate to get to you. No. Yeah. How desperate are you? Are you willing to call Lutheran pastors two hours away? Maybe. Oh. Yeah, maybe, maybe I know. So this th and this is the sort of like orientation that I want to sort of inculcate you about community. That you should be willing to go to great lengths to receive it. That's why when I first got here, I told people, like, because I didn't, I don't think that it's a faithful practice to pre-consecrate elements and then take them on your own somewhere else. Right? Um, what what I was opting for then is if you can't make it because of COVID or you have extra health concerns, like I'll come to your house and I'll sit on the porch and I'll I'll even stand 100 yards away and I'll yell everything to you if I have to. Right? Because I want you to have this as part of my 
is part of my responsibility as your pastor to make sure you're receiving the gifts of God, right? All of my niceness and, and calls and all that are, are not worth much in comparison to the actual reception of the body of Lord Jesus, right? Uh, so that should be something that we take great effort to do. Now, to comfort somebody in a situation like that, that doesn't mean that if you're not getting it on a certain at a certain frequency, that you're in trouble because of that. Right? That was one of the reasons that during COVID, we had time to sort of figure that out. Because it's not like um, if like if for whatever reason maybe you got sick and you couldn't go to church and say you missed a week of communion and then halfway through the next week the Lord calls you home and you're you're just in trouble because you didn't have communion. That's not the way that works, right? What is the purpose of communion? It clearly doesn't create faith because we don't give it to people who don't have faith. So what does it do? It sustains and strengthens us. Right? And so uh, I usually use the image of dinner, right? So obviously dinner doesn't apply in some ways, as Paul's talking about here, but it does apply in some, in that this is supposed to be spiritual nourishment for your faith. So if you skip dinner here and there, what happens? Not a big problem. Not a big problem. But if you go months without it, you don't eat food at all, what happens? What? You eventually die, right? Because it turns out your body needs some food to live, right? So this is another, like, communion gives you a nice insight into why we don't buy stuff that says, like, well, I, you know, I worship on my own, I go out to nature, and I experience God there, and so I don't need to go to church. I said, well, it may be very well. True, it is true that you experience God in nature. It proclaims his glory, but it doesn't then follow that you don't need to come to church, right? Uh, because what you're doing when you do that is you're substituting your own sense of, of faith with what Christ actually desires to do. To sustain that. And whatever we come up with is not going to be nearly as good. Right? That's like my whole job, actually. My whole job, one of my favorite pastoral titles. I think I said this before, is that I am a steward of the mysteries of God. My whole job is to do what Paul says here, to take what, what Christ has given me and give it to you, and to do that faithfully. Um, and that's the, that's the goal of all of this, this learning and discussion. Of being a it isn't to get rid of a practice that you like or add a new one that you don't like or like. It's what's true and faithful in God's word. Because a part of our pastoral theology is that I'm going to have to give an account, right? When, when Jesus is talking about not everybody is, is meant to be teachers because teachers are going to be held account on a different level, right? I'm going to have to be held accountable for the way that this gift is given. And whatever awkward situation you can cook up at your communion rail is far less frightening to me than facing God knowingly having practiced this gift unfaithfully. And I offered up my son's body and blood for your redemption, and you threw the pearls before the swan. I don't want to have that conversation. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I, I ask pastorally speaking is if you have friends or family that come in from out of town, have a conversation with them about communion in the church. If they're active members of another church that we don't share confession with, then you need to let them know that they're not going to be able to take communion here. And you do that in a loving way, and you explain why if they ask questions. Okay? Or if you're uncomfortable having that conversation, you can just say you'll need to talk to the pastor about communion before uh, before church. And then they, uh, they come up and they can receive a blessing, and I'm always happy to chat with people about what they have. And we're about to find out why that our practice of that is actually loving towards them. So let's, let's go on here. Verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. This is where we get the confession part you guys are talking about. Before. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, 
We are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Okay. So what does what does Paul say happens to those who eat and drink the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? We'll start with that first part. What happens? Huh? Sick and die. They get sick and die, right? He's talking about that. But what what is he, there's a phrase he uses there. What are they or they're guilty about something? Yeah, there's guilty concerning the body and blood. So that's that's one. What exactly? Like, how do I eat the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? He's already talked about a few things, right? If I drain the cup and don't give it to other people, if I'm if I'm trying to provide like my own sustenance through this meal at the cost of others, uh, all those sorts of things. Those are unworthy. Right? Uh, and then what he gives one more thing that makes your reception unworthy. Yes, yes. So in verse 29 there, he says specifically, without discerning the body, right? without discerning that this really is the body and blood of Christ. And drink, so that person then eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So, does being guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord and eating and drinking judgment upon oneself sound like good things? No. Do we want those for people who are visiting our church? No. We don't. And so uh, when we practice closed communion, it's not because we don't want those people to come to the table. We want them to come to the table when it is salvific and beneficial as God intends. And what we're told here in the scriptures by Paul is there are ways in which that can be done where it is not the blessing that God intends it to be. And one of those happens to be if they do not discern that it really is the body and blood of Jesus. So my job as a pastor and ours as brothers and sisters in Christ in some, in some respect is to make sure that when we want them to come to the table, but we want them to come to the table to receive the blessing God intends. And we've been given some, some rules here. That's one of the reasons I like calling it the Lord's Supper. Possessive. It reminds me as a pastor and a congregation that this table is not my table. It's the Lord's table. And he's the host, so he gets to set the rules. And so I'm just doing my best to abide by the rules he set. What if a visitor belongs to a denomination uh, who, you know, who uh, years of communion do not match ours but their personal views do match ours? You know, they, they know, despite you know their denomination, they know that it is the body and blood of Christ, you know, of, of one consumption. But what do you do then? If, they, if their denomination says one thing, they, you know, go another thing. Um, I would first say that as a member of a denomination that we're not in fellowship with, I can't give you communion. But I would encourage you then to become a member of our denomination. <laughs> if your beliefs line up with ours, why are you going to church there? So people come up with all kinds of secondary reasons why they like being in the particular church there. And I understand. But if one of the primary reasons that you're even going to church, period, is not in line with where you're at, those secondary things are secondary for a reason. Right? Like, it doesn't mean that you can no longer talk to those people or hang out with them or treat them as your friends. But I would encourage you to go to a church where you're receiving the first fruits Painful. That should be of much more importance to you than how much you like the people that you're going to church with. That's wonderful when all that works together. But this is where you'll get, like, when kids grow up in households that have those kinds of beliefs about church, their kids will go off to college and maybe they don't particularly like the style of worship they also see this church at their school has. Well, they'll start going to a non denominational or Baptist church because, well, I just like the way they do worship better, except they're going to a place that has a completely different confession of faith where they're not actually going to receive the things that we think are the most important and really the purpose of the church over a secondary reason that shouldn't be as important. Right? And we're in a lot of messes with this in our culture right now because we've gone down that road so far. It's sort of like if you get into a relationship with somebody and you find out seven months in, 
they have no interest in becoming a Christian and have no desire to go to church with them. And then you start thinking, well, I don't think we can get married then because that's going to affect everything in our life going forward. But it's a lot messier because you've been dating them for seven months. You probably should have that conversation way sooner and make it clear that that is a deal breaker. And then it's, I mean, there's still, there's always going to be a little mess with that, but it's going to be less than it. Like, so it's much more difficult for somebody to make that decision if they've been going to a church while not believing really what that church teaches about key things for like 15 years. So they have deep relationships with the people there and they may be involved in serving. And so my encouragement is like, don't put yourself in that sort of situation, right? Um, and if you're like, that's at its heart, here's what I'll say. At its heart, that's confusing the purpose of church. Like going to church is never meant to be a form of evangelism. Going to church is for the believers sustaining in the faith by receiving these gifts. Right? And in our culture, we've confused what, what the worship service and, and the gathering of the church is supposed to be about. Right? Now, once you leave from that gathering, the job of the church is to evangelize, is to bear witness to Christ, is to invite other people into that. But we've, we've blurred the lines there in some really damaging ways. But so we, a lot of churches have become oriented to making their worship service about the potential person who may show up, and instead they're depriving the people who go every week from the things that they need to get. Because they're using Sunday morning as a way of evangelizing instead of as a way of res restoration and, and sustaining for the flock. Does that make sense? So... I think the the tendency to go to a church where you don't fully agree with the, like the some of the core things they teach because you like the people and, and this and by by going to it I mean that that's your primary church and your member there I think stems from that worry is that in some way they're thinking that maybe they can sway some minds or um, you know or whatever it is there's also issues where people are doing that because. They maybe agree with us about communion, but they disagree with us about something else. But again, we go back to the public act of, of coming to the table with those people is that people are going to see that and assume that you believe the things they believe because you're proclaiming. That's what you're proclaiming. That's what you're communing, right? Which is why it would be very, like, imagine that you were uh, going around on a Saturday in Pittsburgh and uh, you were with your kids down in the strip district and there's a cool little Catholic church, and you go in there and you want to look around, and they're having a, a mass on Saturday, and you see me there, your pastor, taking communion in a Catholic church. What would that do? That's all the same. Right, or you'd be like, well, wait a minute. Which is it? Right? But at best, it, it, it would ignore the distinctions that the scriptures make, and at worst, it's, it prompts questions of doubt. Because you're like, well, wait a minute, we say this and they say this. They can't both be true. So what is it, right? And so what I'm actually doing, and I would actually get in trouble for this as a pastor, um, and I should, I would actually be harming the witness of Christ. Because I'm, I'm, I'm publicly proclaiming two things that both can't be true. Yeah. Someone who says and they in the mind are saying, you know, Yes, which is precisely why this is a dangerous thing, right? It's because you're going to get what what is when the words of institution are spoken and, and the, the elements are consumed. You're going to get the body and blood of Jesus. That's, but notice Paul doesn't say that. What he says is that you're going to be guilty concerning the body and blood you have received because you don't believe that it's actually there. Correct. Right. Instead of the blessing of the body and blood, you're receiving the judgment. Um, and that's yeah, yeah. What if the Lutheran Church signed the Zoe Sandy? Huh? We all believe what we're talking about. But they're more liberal than us. We go to that church. Or... No, so the for us the criteria for communion are um, if you are coming from a church that we have worship fellowship with, in other words. I could go preach at their church and they could come preach at ours. Right? 
Um, and in the United States, there aren't many that we are in fellowship with. Um, so, because what's at stake here isn't just that you share the confession about communion, right? Because when you do the public act of communion, uh, in the word itself tells you what you're communicating. You're not just communicating that you specifically agree with this meal practice, but that you're in communion with the people that you're receiving. Right? Um, and so it's the whole confession of faith. It's not just the particular belief about communion itself, right? So like if you came to, if you came to our church, you're like, well, I believe it's the real presence. Um, and I might say over the course of weeks, and by the way, my policy is like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So if you come and visit and I talk about how great he is, and then you come up there and you put your hands out like you know what you're doing, I don't know what's in your heart, right? And I just told you that stuff. You could be somebody visiting the lane. So I usually will err on this. I'll ask, I'll say, are you going to take communion? Um, because sometimes people don't know what's going on. So they don't know. Um, but if they say yes, I'll give it to them. But I'm going to find them after church if I can and talk to them about that. And say, you know, here at the church, um, you know, I don't really give communion to people unless they're expressing their intent to join and they share our confession. Um, and then, uh, or if you're coming from another church that we have alternate corporate fellowship. Right? Um, and that's, and, and this is where I think communion was never a divisive practice. Even closed communion was not a divisive practice until we, we blurred the lines on what worship is about on Sunday. Because churches want to think that communion is a form of evangelism. So if we don't let people in to communion, they're never going to come back to our church. Right? And they think that if we do, that'll be the reason they stay. Right? That's evangelism, but that's not what communion is for. Right? Because if those are the arguments that we're going to make, then I would say, well, you could you could even let a non-believer have communion if the goal is to use communion as a way of getting them into the church. But that's not what it's for. Um, and so uh, there's going to be some difficulty with that because it's been the other way for so long that there are some people that will expect it. Although I will say in all the times in my experience so far where I've had these sorts of conversations with somebody, I haven't, I haven't had anybody sort of huff at me and say, well, I'm never coming back then. But then okay, you know, that, I understand what you're saying. That makes sense. Um, and some of them, they then want to learn more and become a member and have communion. And others, they say they disagree with that and they, they don't come back. And that's okay. Like, maybe that's like, this is where we can't assume that we know how that person's faith journey is supposed to go. Right? Uh, then, we're, when, then we're ascribing too much power and authority to ourselves. Right? We, we might, we might tend, be tempted to say, well, if I had given that person communion, then they would have stayed and become a member of our church. Who knows, right? Maybe that would have made them never come to a right understanding of their relationship with God because it would have been built on something that isn't biblical. And maybe the thing they needed to hear was that this isn't just for anyone and everyone. It's for those who God intended to be a blessing with. We would love for you to be at the table. We gotta, we gotta talk about some things first. Maybe that's the first time in their whole life anybody's told them that this is a serious and meaningful thing and actually demonstrated. And so then maybe they come back next week and they're like, I want to hear more about that. Nobody's ever talked that way about communion. Right? We can't assume that we know better than the way God has set up the church to function. Right? And so, even when it's difficult for us, because I mean, I would rather not have to do that. It's complicated and messy. It means I have to talk to people I don't know about things that are going to potentially upset them. My job would be way easier if I could just let everybody come. But as Luther said, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. It's his stuff, not mine. So I got to do my best to, to try and do that the way that he wants it to Now, if you have a disagreement with that, come to me, talk to me, make your case from scripture. Right? Um, it's been around for a long time, so I'll just be upfront about I doubt that you can convince me otherwise from the scriptures. But there's no harm in trying because if it's from the scriptures, then it's the truth. And I'm not afraid of the truth. Right? Does that make sense? The way that's all set up? What are some difficulties? Or is anybody having some difficulties with that? Questions? How then are we to view other churches and people who receive communion in a way or with 
Ah, oh, great, great question. The question is, how are we to view people who receive community to other churches with a different understanding? So, um, this is where I think the language that serves you best is the language of good, better, and best. Because the temptation might be, be like, well, they're heathens, they're all guilty concerning the body and blood of Jesus, and so they're just screwed. Only the Lutherans, we get it. We're the only ones going to heaven. Sorry, that would be a lonely and lonely party. I don't want that. Um, turns out Jesus has better plans than we do. So the way that we view that, I think, is in a practice of good, better, and best. And I think this is how you can actually honestly encourage somebody to come to your particular church without sounding arrogant. Um, why would, well, let me just ask you, why would you want someone to come here as opposed to a Baptist church? Because presumably you do, because you come here instead of going to a Baptist church. So why is that? The truth is proclaimed here. Okay? Let's get a little more specific than that, because I would say there's the truth is probably proclaimed in a number of Baptist churches to a certain degree in many different ways. And it's okay if you have trouble answering that question. Okay, we, so you believe that what we're doing here is what is going along with what the Bible says. What are you saying? Well, it's an exposition that the word, the same thing. Right. Yeah. So essentially what it boils down to is the reason that you're here, which is the same reason that I'm here, is that we believe that our confession is the most faithful exposition of the scripture. Right? Is that fair to say? If that's the case, why would you not want all the people you're witnessing to to be here? We do, right? Okay. So how can I have that thought without doing other churches? Because that's a danger. It does happen. Right? People think, well, if you're not a part of our church, you're lost. We don't we don't hold that belief. It's good to be at another church. It's better than not attending yes. any. Right. Exactly. So this is where the language of good, better, best, and certain right? is. If you have a friend who's completely unbelieving, and you move away, and they come to faith five years later, and you find out they're going to a Baptist church, is that a good thing? Yes, it is. It is a good thing. Is it the best thing? Yes. No. That's okay. And it's okay to, to be genuine about that when you talk about it. You don't, you don't bash them over the head with you. But if you go to church, <laughs> mine is way better. <laughs> but you're just honestly, you know, exhorting why it is that you go there instead of here. And I think people respect that, right? Uh, I'm not saying that you, you can't go here and, and be saved. Not at all. Right? What I am saying is the reason that I didn't go join you there is because I believe what I have here is better. And I can give you some specific reasons as to why. And you may disagree with them, which is fine. But otherwise, they might ask you, well, why don't you come to my church? What are you going to say? Well, we've got some deep relationships with people that are in our church that we really like. And, and so we, you know, and they might say, well, but there's some really good people in my church, too. And you just haven't met them. So if we boil it down to church being like a happy, fun social club, you start to lose all the reasons why you're in the particular place you are. Right? And it's okay to have the particular reasons why you go to the church. It doesn't mean by you having those particular reasons that you hate people who don't, right? That's the sort of way our culture wants us to think about differences. They want us to think that difference equals hate. Right? Um, and what we're talking about here is big, better, best. I think it's fantastic. I'm praising God that you're going to this Baptist church. I have something I think would be better for you because that's why I'm there. Because if I thought that the Baptist church was better than this one, where would I be? I would be there, right? And my vicar supervisor would say, I'm here because I believe this is where Jesus is most faithfully present. If you can find a place where you think he's more faithfully present than here, please tell me because that's where I want to be, right? And so the, the goal here isn't Lutheran versus Baptist versus Methodist or Catholic or whatever. It's where is Jesus faithfully taught the most? That should be the goal of everyone looking for. 
We're a little over time. Sorry. Um, so we will uh, we'll finish up the discussion of Lord's Supper uh, stuff on the 22nd, so two weeks from today. And that'll be our last one for uh, before we take our break in the second. If, uh, if you want, I can keep your, if you want to write your name on your handout, I can keep your handout and give it back to you on the 22nd. We're going to work on the same one where you can keep it yourself and bring it back. All right, let's close with a word of, of prayer. And let's just do the, the Lord's Prayer today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. All right, uh, I do know that this is a personal issue for some people, and you may have some questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in the whole group. Any, if you want to come up and ask me about them afterwards, I'd be happy to have those conversations. Have a great week. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there, and we'll see you next week.